Section 13, Book 13, Part 2 of the Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 2, from My Life, Poetry and Truth, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, 1812 to 1877, Book 13, Part 2. As the occupations to which one devotes one's day are never so serious and pressing that one cannot find time enough in the evening to go to the play, thus it was also with me who, in the want of a really good stage, did not cease thinking of the German theatre in order to discover how one might cooperate upon it with any degree of activity. Its condition in the second half of the last century is sufficiently known, and every one who wishes to be instructed about it finds assistance at hand everywhere. On this account I only intend to insert here a few general remarks. The success of the stage rested more upon the personality of the actors than upon the value of the pieces. This was especially the case with pieces half or wholly extemporised when everything depended on the humour and talent of the comic actors. The matter of such pieces must be taken out of the commonest life in conformity with the people before whom they are acted. From this immediate application arises the greatest applause which these plays have always gained. They were always at home in South Germany, where they are retained to the present day, and the change of persons alone renders it necessary to give from time to time some change to the character of the comic masks. However, the German theatre, in conformity with the serious character of the nation, soon took a turn towards the moral, which was still more accelerated by an external cause. For the question arose among strict Christians, whether the theatre belonged to those sinful things which are to be shunned at all events, or to those indifferent things which can be good to the good and bad to the bad. Some zealots denied the latter, and held fast the opinion that no clergyman should ever enter the theatre. Now the opposite opinion could not be maintained with energy, unless the theatre was declared to be not only harmless but even useful. To be useful, it must be moral, and in this direction it developed itself in North Germany, the more as, by a sort of half-taste, the comic character, footnote, die lustige Person, that is to say the permanent buffoon, like Kasperle in the German puppet shows, or Scannerella in Molière's broad comedies, translator, end of footnote, was banished, and though intelligent persons took his part, was forced to retire, having already gone from the coarseness of the German Hanswurst, Jack Pudding, into the neatness and delicacy of the Italian and French harlequins, even Scapin and Crispin gradually vanished. The latter I saw played for the last time by Koch, in his old age. Richardson's novels had already made the citizen world attentive to a more delicate morality. The severe and inevitable consequences of a feminine faux pas were analysed in a frightful manner in Clarissa. Lessing's Miss Sarah Sampson treated the same theme. The French dramas had the same end, but proceeded more moderately and contrived to please by some accommodation at the end. Diderot's Père de Famille, the honourable criminal, the vinegar dealer, the philosopher without knowing it, Eugenie, and other works of the sort, suited that honest feeling of citizen and family which began more and more to prevail. With us, the grateful son, the deserter from parental love and all of their kin, went the same way. The minister, Clementini, and other pieces by Gela, the German father of a family by Gaming, all brought agreeably to view the worth of the middle and even of the lower class, and delighted the great public. Eckhoff, by his noble personality, 
which gave to the actor's profession a dignity which it hitherto been deficient in, elevated to an uncommon degree the leading characters in such pieces, since, as an honest man, the expression of honesty succeeded with him to perfection. While now the German theatre was completely inclining to effeminacy, Schroeder arose as an author and actor, and on the occasion of the connection between Hamburg and England adapted some English comedies. The material of these he could only use in the most general way, since the originals are for the most part formless, and if they begin well and according to a certain plan, they wander from the mark at last. The sole concern of their authors seems to be the introduction of the oddest scenes, and whoever is accustomed to a sustained work of art at last unwillingly finds himself driven into the boundless. Besides this, a wild, immoral, vulgarly dissolute tone so decidedly pervades the whole to an intolerable degree that it must have been difficult to deprive the plan and the characters of all their bad manners. They are a coarse and at the same time dangerous food which can only be enjoyed and digested by a large and half-corrupted populace at a certain time. Schroeder did more for these things than is usually known. He thoroughly altered them, assimilated them to the German mind, and softened them as much as possible. But still a bitter kernel always remains in them, because the joke often depends on the ill usage of persons, whether they deserve it or not. In these performances, which were also widely spread upon our stage, lay a secret counterpoise to that too delicate morality, and the action of both kinds of drama against each other fortunately prevented the monotony into which people would otherwise have fallen. The German, kind and magnanimous by nature, likes to see no one ill-treated. But as no man, however well he thinks, is secure that something may not be put upon him against his inclination, and as moreover comedy in general, if it is to please, always presupposes or awakens something of malice in the spectator, so by a natural path did people come to a conduct which hitherto have been deemed unnatural. This consisted in lowering the higher classes, and more or less attacking them. Satire, whether in prose or verse, had always avoided touching the court and nobility. Harbiner refrained from all jokes in that direction, and remained in a lower circle. Zachariah occupies himself much with caricaturing noblemen, comically sets forth their tastes and peculiarities, but this is done without contempt. Tummel's Wilhelmina an ingenious little composition as pleasant as it is bold, gained great applause, perhaps because the author, himself a nobleman and courtier, treated his own class unsparingly. But the boldest step was taken by Lessing in his Emilia Galotti, where the passions and intrigues of the higher classes are delineated in a bitter and cutting manner. All these things perfectly corresponded to the excited spirit of the time, and men of less mind and talent thought they might do the same or even more, as indeed Grossman, in six unsavoury dishes, served up to the malicious public all the tippets of his vulgar kitchen. An honest man, Hofrat Reinhardt, was the major domo at this unpleasant board, to the comfort and edification of all the guests. From this time forward, the theatrical villains were always chosen from the higher ranks, and a person must be a gentleman of the bedchamber, or at least a private secretary, to be worthy of such a distinction. But for the most godless examples, the highest offices and places in the court and civil list were chosen, in which high society, even the justiciaries, found their place as villains of the first water. 
but as i must feel already that i have been carried beyond the time which is now the subject in hand i return back to myself to mention the impulse which i felt to occupy myself in my leisure hours with the theatrical plans which i had once devised by my lasting interest in shakespeare's works i had so expanded my mind that the narrow compass of the stage and the short time allowed to a representation seemed to me by no means sufficient to bring forward something important the life of the gallant Goetz von Berlichingen, written by himself, impelled me into the historic mode of treatment, and my imagination so much extended itself that my dramatic form also went beyond all theatrical bounds and sought more and more to approach the living events. I had, as I proceeded, talked circumstantially on this subject with my sister, who was interested heart and soul in such things, and renewed this conversation so often without going to any work that she at last growing impatient and at the same time wishing me well urgently entreated me not to be always casting my words into the air but once for all to set down upon paper that which must have been so present to my mind determined by this impulse i began one morning to write without having made any previous sketch or plan I wrote the first scenes, and in the evening they were read aloud to Cornelia. She gave them much applause, but only conditionally, since she doubted that I should go on. Nay, she even expressed a decided unbelief in my perseverance. This only incited me the more. I wrote on the next day, and also the third. Hope increased with the daily communications, and from step to step everything gained more life while the matter, moreover, had become thoroughly my own. Thus I kept without interruption to my work, which I pursued straight on, looking neither backwards nor forwards, neither to the right nor to the left. And in about six weeks I had the pleasure to see the manuscript stitched. I communicated it to Merck, who spoke sensibly and kindly about it. I sent it to Herder, who, on the contrary, expressed himself unkindly and severely and did not fail in some lampoons written for the occasion to give me nicknames on account of it i did not allow myself to be perplexed by this but took a clear view of my object the die was now cast and the only question was how to play the game best i plainly saw that even here no one would advise me and as after some time I could regard my work as if it had proceeded from another hand, I indeed perceived that in my attempt to renounce unity of time and place I had also infringed upon that higher unity which is so much the more required. Since, without plan or sketch, I had merely abandoned myself to my imagination and to an internal impulse, I had not deviated much at the beginning, and the first act, could fairly pass for what they were intended to be in the following acts however and especially towards the end i was unconsciously carried along by a wonderful passion while trying to describe adelaide as amiable i had fallen in love with her myself my pen was involuntarily devoted to her alone the interest in her fate gained the preponderance and as apart from this consideration Goetz, towards the end, is without activity, and afterwards only returns to an unlucky participation in the Bahnkrieg, footnote, the peasant war, answering to the Jacquerie in France, translator into footnote. Nothing was more natural than that a charming woman should supplant him in the mind of the author, who, casting off the fetters of art, thought to try himself in a new field. This defect or rather this culpable superfluity i soon perceived since the nature of my poetry always impelled me to unity i now instead of the biography of goetz and german antiquities kept my own work in mind and sought to give it more and more historical and national substance and to cancel that which was fabulous or 
merely proceeded from passion. In this I indeed sacrificed much as the inclination of the man had to yield to the conviction of the artist. Thus, for instance, I had pleased myself highly by making Adelaide enter into a terrific nocturnal gypsy scene and perform wonders by her beautiful presence. A nearer examination banished her. And the love affair between France and his noble gracious lady, which was very circumstantially carried on in the fourth and fifth acts, was but condensed and could only be suffered to appear in its chief points. Therefore, without altering anything in the first manuscript, which I still possess in its original shape, I determined to rewrite the whole, and did this with such activity that in a few weeks an entirely new made piece lay before me. I went to work upon this all the quicker. The less my intention was ever to have the second poem printed, as I looked upon this likewise as a mere preparatory exercise, which in future I should again lay at the foundation of a new treatment, to be accomplished with greater industry and deliberation. When I began to lay before Merck many proposals as to the way in which I should set about this task, he laughed at me, and asked, what was the meaning of this perpetual writing and rewriting? The thing, he said, by this means, becomes only different, and seldom better. One must see what effect one thing produces, and then again try something new. Be in time at the hedge if you would dry your linen, he exclaimed in the words of the proverb footnote. Anglicy, make hay when the sun shines, translator, end of footnote. Hesitation and delay only make uncertain men. On the other hand, I replied to him that it would be unpleasant to me to offer to a bookseller a work on which I have bestowed so much affection, and perhaps to receive a refusal as an answer. For how would they judge of a young, nameless, and also audacious author? As my dread of the press gradually vanished, I had wished to see printed my comedy De Mitschuldigen, upon which I set some value, but I found no publisher inclined in my favour. Here the technically mercantile taste of my friend was at once excited. By means of the Frankfurt Zeitung Gazette, he had already formed a connection with learned men and booksellers, and therefore he thought that we ought to publish at our own expense this singular and certainly striking work, and that we should derive a larger profit from it. Like many others, he often used to reckon up for the booksellers their profit, which with many works was certainly great, especially if one left out of the account how much was lost by other writings and commercial affairs. Enough it was settled that I should procure the paper, and that he should take care of the printing. Thus we went heartily to work, and I was not displeased gradually to see my wild, dramatic sketch in clean proof-sheets. It looked really neater than I myself expected. We completed the work, and it was sent off in many parcels. Before long a great commotion arose everywhere. The attention which it created became universal. But because, with our limited means, the copies could not be sent quick enough to all parts, a pirated edition suddenly made its appearance. As, moreover, there could be no immediate return, especially in ready money, for the copies sent out, so was I, as a young man in a family whose treasury could not be in an abundant condition, at the very time when much attention, nay, much applause was bestowed upon me, extremely perplexed as to how I should pay for the paper, by means of which I had made the world acquainted with my talent. On the other hand, Merck, who knew better how to help himself, entertained the best hopes that all would soon come right again. But I never perceived that to be the case. Through the little pamphlets which I had published anonymously, I had at my own expense learned to know the critics and the public, and I was thus pretty well prepared for praise and blame, especially as for many years I had constantly followed up the subject 
and had observed how those authors were treated to whom I had devoted particular attention. Here, even in my uncertainty, I could plainly remark how much that was groundless, one-sided, and arbitrary was recklessly uttered. Now the same thing befell me. And if I had not had some basis of my own, how much would the contradictions of cultivated men have perplexed me? Thus, for instance, there was in the German Mercury a diffuse, well-meant criticism composed by some man of limited mind. Where he found fault, I could not agree with him, still less when he stated how the affair could have been done otherwise. It was therefore highly gratifying to me when immediately afterwards I found a pleasant explanation by Wieland, who in general opposed the critic and took my part against him. However, the former review was printed, likewise. I saw an example of the dull state of mind among well-informed and cultivated men. How then would it look with the great public? pleasure of talking over such things with Merck and thus gaining light upon them was of short duration, for the intelligent landgravine of Hesse-Darmstadt took him with her train on her journey to Petersburg. The detailed letters which he wrote to me gave me a further insight into the world, which I could the more make my own as the descriptions were made by a well-known and friendly hand. But nevertheless I remained very solitary for a long time, and just at this important epoch, was deprived of his enlightening sympathy, of which I then stood in so much need. Just as one embraces the determination to become a soldier and go to the wars, and courageously resolves to bear danger and difficulties, as well as to endure wounds and pains, and even death, but at the same time never calls to mind the particular cases in which those generally anticipated evils may surprise us in an extremely unpleasant manner. So it is with every one who ventures into the world, especially an author, and so it was with me. As the great part of mankind is more excited by a subject than by the treatment of it, so it was to the subject that the sympathy of young men for my pieces was generally owing. They thought they could see in them a banner, under the guidance of which all that is wild and unpolished in youth might find a vent, and those of the very best brains who had previously harboured a similar crotchet were thus carried away. I still possess a letter, I know not to whom, from the excellent and in many respects unique Burger which may serve as an important voucher of the effect and excitement which was then produced by that phenomenon. On the other side, some men blamed me for painting the club law in too favourable colours, and even attributed to me the intention of bringing those disorderly times back again. Others took me for a profoundly learned man, and wished me to publish a new edition with notes of the original narrative of the good Goetz, a task to which I felt by no means adapted, though I allowed my name to be put on the title to the new impression. Because I had understood how to gather the flowers of a great existence, they took me for a careful gardener. However, this learning and profound knowledge of mine were much doubted by others. A respectable man of business quite unexpectedly pays me a visit. I find myself highly honoured by this, especially as he opens his discourse with the praise of my Goetz von Berlichingen and my good insight into German history. But I am nevertheless astonished when I remark that he has really come for the sole purpose of informing me that Goetz von Berlichingen was no brother-in-law to Franz von Sichingen, and that therefore by this poetical matrimonial alliance I have committed a great historical error. I sought to excuse myself by the fact that Goetz himself calls him so, but was met by the reply that this is a form of expression which only denotes a nearer and more friendly connection, just as in modern times we call postilions brothers-in-law. 
It is a German peculiarity to apply the word Schwager, brother-in-law to a Bastilian, translator, without being bound to them by any family tie. I thanked him as well as I could for this information, and only regretted that the evil was now not to be remedied. This was regretted by him also, while he exhorted me in the kindest manner to a further study of the German history and constitution, and offered me his library, of which I afterwards made a good use. A droll event of the sort which occurred to me was the visit of a bookseller who, with cheerful openness, requested a dozen of such pieces and promised to pay well for them. That we made ourselves very merry about this may be imagined, and yet, in fact, he was not so very far wrong, for I was already greatly occupied in moving backwards and forwards from this turning point in German history, and in working up the chief events in a similar spirit. A laudable design, which, like many others, was frustrated by the rushing flight of time. That play, however, had not solely occupied the author, but while it was devised, written, rewritten, printed, and circulated, other images and plans were moving in his mind. Those which could be treated dramatically had the advantage of being oftenest thought over and brought near to execution, but at the same time was developed a transition to another form which is not usually classed with those of the drama, but yet has a great affinity with them. The transition was chiefly brought about by a peculiarity of the author which fashioned soliloquy into dialogue. Accustomed to pass his time most pleasantly in society, he changed even solitary thought into social converse, and this in the following manner. He had the habit, when he was alone, of calling before his mind any person of his acquaintance. This person he entreated to sit down, walked up and down by him, remained standing before him, and discoursed with him on the subject he had in his mind. To this the person answered, as occasion required, or by the ordinary gestures signified his assent or dissent, in which every man has something peculiar to himself. The speaker then continued to carry out further that which seemed to please the guest, or to condition and define more closely that of which he disapproved, and finally was polite enough to give up his notion. The oddest part of the affair was that he never selected persons of his intimate acquaintance, but those whom he saw but seldom, nay, several who lived at a distance in the world, and with whom he had a transient connection. They were, however, chiefly persons who, more of a receptive than communicative nature, are ready with a pure feeling to take interest in the things which fall within their sphere, though he often summoned contradicting spirits to these dialectic exercises. Persons of both sexes, of every age and rank, accommodated themselves to these discussions and showed themselves obliging and agreeable since he only conversed on subjects which were clear to them and which they liked. Nevertheless, it would have appeared extremely strange to many of them could they have learned how often they were summoned to these ideal conversations, since many of them would scarcely have come to a real one. How nearly such a mental dialogue is akin to a written correspondence is clear enough, only in the latter one sees returned the confidence one has bestowed, while in the former one creates for oneself a confidence which is new, ever-changing, and unreturned. When, therefore, he had to describe that disgust which men, without being driven by necessity, feel for life, the author necessarily hit at once upon the plan of giving his sentiments in letters. For all gloominess, is a birth of pupil of solitude, and what is more opposed to it than a cheerful society. The enjoyment in life felt by others is to him a painful reproach, and thus by that which would charm him out of himself he is directed back to his inmost soul. 
if he at all expresses himself on this matter it will be by letters for no one feels immediately opposed to a written effusion whether it be joyful or gloomy while an answer containing opposite reasons gives the lonely one an opportunity to confirm himself in his whims an occasion to grow still more obdurate the letters of Werther, which are written in this spirit have so various a charm precisely because their different contents were first talked over with several individuals in such ideal dialogues while it was afterwards in the composition itself that they appeared to be directed to one friend and sympathiser to say more on the treatment of a little book which has formed the subject of so much discussion would be hardly advisable but with respect to the contents something may yet be added that disgust at life has its physical and its moral causes the former we will leave to the investigation of the physician the latter to that of the moralist and in a matter so often elaborated only consider the chief point where the phenomenon most plainly expresses itself all comfort in life is based upon a regular recurrence of external things the change of day and night of the seasons of flowers and fruits and whatever else meets us from epoch to epoch so that we can and should enjoy it these are the proper springs of earthly life the more open we are to these enjoyments the happier do we feel ourselves but if the changes in these phenomena roll up and down before us without our taking interest in them if we are insensible to such beautiful offers then comes on the greatest evil the heaviest disease we regard life as a disgusting burden it is said of an englishman that he hanged himself that he might no longer dress and undress himself every day i knew a worthy gardener the superintendent of the laying out of a large park who once cried out with vexation shall i always see these clouds moving from east to west the story is told of one of our most excellent men that he saw with vexation the returning green of spring and wished that by way of change it might once appear red these are properly the symptoms of a weariness of life which does not unfrequently result in suicide and which in thinking men absorbed in themselves was more frequent than can be imagined nothing occasions this weariness more than the return of love the first love it is rightly said is the only one for in the second and by the second the highest sense of love is already lost the conception of the eternal and infinite which elevates and supports it is destroyed and it appears transient like everything else that recurs the separation of the sensual from the moral which in the complicated cultivated world sunders the feelings of love and desire produces here also an exaggeration which can lead to no good moreover a young man soon perceives in others if not in himself that moral epochs change as well as the seasons of the year the graciousness of the great the favour of the strong the encouragement of the active the attachment of the multitude the love of individuals all this changes up and down and we can no more hold it fast than the sun moon and stars and yet these things are not mere natural events they escape us either by our own or by another's fault but change they do and we are never sure of them but that which most pains a sensitive youth is the unceasing return of our faults for how late do we learn to see that while we cultivate our virtues we rear our faults at the same time the former depend upon the latter as upon their root and the latter send forth secret ramifications as strong and various as those which the former send forth in open light because now we generally practise our virtues with 
will and consciousness but are unconsciously surprised by our faults the former seldom procure us any pleasure while the latter constantly bring trouble and pain here lies the most difficult point in self-knowledge that which makes it almost impossible if we conceive in addition to all this a young boiling blood an imagination easily to be paralysed by single objects and moreover the uncertain movements of the day we shall not find unnatural an impatient striving to free oneself from such a strait however such gloomy contemplations which lead him who has resigned himself to them into the infinite could not have developed themselves so decidedly in the minds of the german youths had not an outward occasion excited and furthered them in this dismal business this was caused by english literature especially the poetical part the great beauties of which are accompanied by an earnest melancholy which it communicates to every one who occupies himself with it the intellectual briton from his youth upwards sees himself surrounded by a significant world which stimulates all his powers he perceives sooner or later that he must collect all his understanding to come to terms with it how many of their poets have in their youth led a loose and riotous life and soon found themselves justified in complaining of the vanity of earthly things how many of them have tried their fortune in worldly occupations have taken parts principal or subordinate in parliament at court in the ministry in situations with the embassy shown their active cooperation in the internal troubles and changes of state and government and if not in themselves at any rate in their friends and patrons frequently made sad and pleasant experiences how many have been banished imprisoned or injured with respect to property even the circumstance of being the spectator of such great events calls man to seriousness and with it can seriousness lead farther than to a contemplation of the transient nature and worthlessness of all earthly things the german also is serious and thus english poetry was extremely suitable to him and because it proceeded from a higher state of things even imposing one finds in it throughout a great apt understanding well practised in the world a deep tender heart an excellent will an impassioned action the very noblest qualities which can be praised in an intellectual and cultivated man but all this put together still makes no poet true poetry announces itself thus that as a worldly gospel it can by internal cheerfulness and external comfort free us from the earthly burdens which press upon us like an air balloon it lifts us together with the ballast which is attached to us into higher regions and lets the confused labyrinths of the earth lie developed before us as in a bird's eye view the most lively as well as the most serious works have the same aim of moderating both pleasure and pain by a felicitous intellectual form let us only in this spirit consider the majority of the english poems chiefly morally didactic and on the average they will only show us a gloomy weariness of life not only young's night thoughts where this theme is pre-eminently worked out but even the other contemplative poems stray before one is aware of it into this dismal region where the understanding is presented with a problem which it cannot solve since even religion much as it can always construct for itself leaves it in the lurch whole volumes might be compiled which could serve as a commentary to this frightful text then old age and experience hand in hand lead him to death and make him understand after a search so painful and so long that all his life he has been in the wrong what further makes the english poets accomplished misanthropes and diffuses over their writings the unpleasant feeling of repugnance against everything 
is the fact that the whole of them, on account of the various divisions of their commonwealth, must devote themselves for the best part, if not for the whole of their lives, to one party or another. Because now a writer of the sort cannot praise and extol those of the party to which he belongs, nor the cause to which he adheres, since, if he did, he would only excite envy and hostility, he exercises his talent in speaking as badly as possible of those on the opposite side, and in sharpening, nay, poisoning, the satirical weapons as much as he can. When this is done by both parties, the world which lies between is destroyed and wholly annihilated, so that in a great mass of sensibly active people one can discover, to use the mildest terms, nothing but folly and madness. Even their tender poems are occupied with mournful subjects. Here a deserted girl is dying, there a faithful lover is drowned or is devoured by a shark before, by his hurried swimming, he reaches his beloved. And if a poet like Ray lies down in a churchyard, and again begins those well-known melodies, he too may gather around him a number of friends to melancholy. Milton's Allegro must scare away gloom in vehement verses before he can attain a very moderate pleasure. And even the cheerful goldsmith loses himself in elegiac feelings when his deserted village, as charmingly as sadly, exhibits to us a lost paradise which his traveller seeks over the whole earth. I do not doubt that lively works, cheerful poems, can be brought forward and opposed to what I have said, but the greatest number, and the best of them, certainly belong to the older epoch, and the newer works which may be set down in the class are likewise of a satirical tendency, are bitter, and treat women especially with contempt. Enough. Those serious poems undermining human nature, which in general terms have been mentioned above, were the favourites which we sought out before all others, one seeking, according to his disposition, the lighter elegiac melancholy, another the heavy oppressive despair which gives up everything. Strangely enough, our father and instructor, Shakespeare, who so well knew how to diffuse a pure cheerfulness, strengthened our feeling of dissatisfaction. Hamlet and his soliloquies were spectres which haunted all the young minds. The chief passages every one knew by heart, and loved to recite, and everybody fancied he had a right to be just as melancholy as the Prince of Denmark, though he had seen no ghost, and had no royal father to avenge. End of section 13「Section 14 Book 13 Part 3 of the Autobiography of Goethe Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Autobiography of Goethe Volume 2 From My Life Poetry and Truth by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by John Oxenford, eighteen twelve to eighteen seventy seven, Book Thirteen, Part Three. But that to all this melancholy a perfectly suitable locality might not be wanting, Ossian had charmed us even to the Ultima Thule, where on a grey boundless heath, wandering among prominent moss covered gravestones, we saw the grass around us moved by an awful wind in a heavily clouded sky above us. It was not till moonlight that the Caledonian night became day. Departed heroes, faded maidens, floated around us, until at last we really thought we saw the spirit of Loda in his fearful form. In such an element, with such surrounding influences, with tastes and studies of this kind, 
tortured by unsatisfied passions by no means excited from without to important actions with the sole prospect that we must adhere to a dull spiritless citizen life we became in gloomy wantonness attached to the thought that we could at all events quit life at pleasure if it no longer suited us and thus miserably enough helped ourselves through the disgusts and weariness of the days this feeling was so general that werther produced its great effect precisely because it struck a chord everywhere and openly and intelligibly exhibited the internal nature of a morbid youthful delusion how accurately the english were acquainted with this sort of wretchedness is shown by the few significant lines written before the appearance of werther Quote, to griefs congenial prone more wounds than nature gave he knew while misery's form his fancy drew in dark ideal hues and horrors not its own End quote. suicide is an event of human nature which whatever may be said and done with respect to it demands the sympathy of every man and in every epoch must be discussed anew montesquieu grants his heroes and great men the right of killing themselves as they think fit since he says that it must be free to every one to close the fifth act of his tragedy as he pleases but here the discourse is not of those persons who have led an active and important life who have sacrificed their days for a great empire or for the cause of freedom and whom one cannot blame if they think to follow in another world the idea which inspires them as soon as it has vanished from the earth we have here to do with those whose life is embittered by a want of action in the midst of the most peaceful circumstances in the world through exaggerated demands upon themselves since i myself was in this predicament and best knew the pain i suffered in it and the exertion it cost me to free myself i will not conceal the reflections which i made with much deliberation on the various kinds of death which one might choose there is something so unnatural in a man tearing himself away from himself not only injuring but destroying himself that he mostly seizes upon mechanical means to carry this design into execution when ajax falls upon his sword it is the weight of his body which does him the last service when the warrior binds his shield-bearer not to let him fall into the hands of the enemy it is still an external force which he secures only a moral instead of a physical one women seek in water a cooling for their despair and the extremely mechanical means of firearms ensure a rapid act with the very least exertion hanging one does not like to mention because it is an ignoble death in england one may first find it because there from youth upwards one sees so many hanged without the punishment being precisely dishonourable by poison by opening the veins the only intention is to depart slowly from life and that most refined rapid and painless death by an adder is worthy of a queen who has passed her life in pleasure and brilliancy but all these are external aids enemies with which man forms an alliance against himself when now i considered all these means and looked about further in history i found among all those who killed themselves no one who did this deed with such greatness and freedom of mind as the emperor otho he having the worst of it as a general but being by no means reduced to extremities resolves to quit the world for the benefit of the empire which in some measure already belongs to him and for the sake of sparing so many thousands he has a cheerful supper with his friends and the next morning it is found that he has plunged a sharp dagger into his heart this deed alone seems to me worthy of imitation 
and i was convinced that whoever could not act in this like otho had no right to go voluntarily out of the world by these convictions i freed myself not so much from the danger as from the whim of suicide which in those splendid times of peace and with an indolent youth had managed to creep in among a considerable collection of weapons i possessed a handsome well-polished dagger this i laid every night by my bed and before i extinguished the candle i tried whether i could succeed in plunging the sharp point a couple of inches deep into my heart since i never could succeed in this i at last laughed myself out of the notion threw off all hypochondriacal fantasies and resolved to live but to be able to do this with cheerfulness i was obliged to solve a poetical problem by which all that i had felt thought and fancied upon this important point should be reduced to words for this purpose i collected the elements which had been at work in me for a few years i rendered present to my mind the cases which had most afflicted and tormented me but nothing could come to a definite form i lacked an event a fable in which they could be overlooked all at once i heard the news of jerusalem's death and immediately after the general report the most accurate and circumstantial description of the occurrence and at this moment the plan of werther was formed and the whole shot together from all sides and became a solid mass just as water in a vessel which stands upon the point of freezing is converted into hard ice by the most gentle shake to hold fast this singular prize to render present to myself and to carry out in all its parts a work of such importance and various contents was the more material to me as i had again fallen into a painful situation which left me even less hope than those which had preceded it and foreboded only sadness if not vexation it is always a misfortune to step into new relations to which one has not been injured we are often against our will lured into a false sympathy the incompleteness of such positions troubles us and yet we see no means either of completing them or of removing them footnote on the incompleteness how bite halfness if there were such a word would be the proper expression translator and footnote fra von la Rouche had married her eldest daughter at frankfurt and often came to visit her but could not reconcile herself to the position which she herself had chosen instead of feeling comfortable or endeavoring to make any alteration she indulged in lamentations so that one was really forced to think that her daughter was unhappy although as she wanted nothing and her husband denied her nothing one could not well see in what her unhappiness properly consisted in the meanwhile i was well received in the house and came into contact with the whole circle which consisted of persons who had partly contributed to the marriage partly wished for it a happy result the dean of st leonhard du mont conceived a confidence nay a friendship with me he was the first catholic clergyman with whom i had come into close contact and who because he was a clear-sighted man gave me beautiful and sufficient explanations of the faith usages and external and internal relations of the oldest church the figure of a well-formed though not young lady named Servieres, i still accurately remember i likewise came into contact with the alosino schweitzer and other families forming a connection with the sons which long continued in the most friendly manner and all at once found myself domesticated in a strange circle in the occupations pleasures and even religious exercises of which i was induced nay compelled to take part my former relation to the young wife which was properly speaking only that of a brother to a sister was continued after marriage my age was suitable to her own 
i was the only one in the whole circle in whom she heard an echo of those intellectual tones to which she had been accustomed from her youth we lived on together in a childish confidence and although there was nothing impassioned in our intercourse it was tormenting enough because she also could not reconcile herself to her new circumstances and although blessed with the goods of fortune had to act as the mother of several stepchildren being moreover transplanted from the cheerful vale of aaron breitstein and a joyous state of youth into a gloomy situated mercantile house amid so many new family connections was i hemmed in without any real participation or cooperation if they were satisfied with each other all seemed to go on as a matter of course but most of the parties concerned turned to me in case of vexation which by my lively sympathy i generally rendered worse rather than better in a short time this situation became quite insupportable to me all the disgusted life which usually springs from such half connections seemed to burden me with double and threefold weight and a new strong resolution was necessary to free myself from it jerusalem's death which was occasioned by his unhappy attachment to the wife of his friend shook me out of the dream and because i not only visibly contemplated that which had occurred to him and me but something similar which befell me at the moment also stirred me to passionate emotion i could not do otherwise than breathe into that production which i had just undertaken all that warmth which leaves no distinction between the poetical and the actual i had completely isolated myself nay prohibited the visits of my friends and internally also i put everything aside that did not immediately belong to the subject on the other hand i embraced everything that had any relation to my design and repeated to myself my nearest life of the contents of which i had as yet made no practical use under such circumstances after such long and so many preparations in secret i wrote werther in four weeks without any scheme of the whole or treatment of any part being previously put on paper the manuscript which was now finished lay before me as a rough draft with few corrections and alterations it was stitched at once for the binding is to a written work of about the same use as the frame is to a picture one can much better see whether there is really anything in it since i had written this much almost unconsciously like a somnambulist i was myself astonished now i went through it that i might alter and improve it in some respects but in the expectation that after some time when i had seen it at a certain distance much would occur to me that would turn to the advantage of the work i gave it to my younger friends to read upon whom it produced an effect so much the greater as contrary to my usual custom i had told no one of it nor discussed my design beforehand yet here again it was the subject matter which really produced the effect and in this respect they were in a frame of mind precisely the reverse of my own for by this composition more than by any other i had freed myself from that stormy element upon which through my own fault and that of others through the mode of life both accidental and chosen through design and thoughtless precipitation through obstinacy and pliability i had been driven about in the most violent manner i felt as if after a general confession once more happy and free and justified in beginning a new life the old household had been of excellent service to me on this occasion but while i felt myself eased and enlightened by having turned reality into poetry my friends were led astray by my work for they thought that poetry ought to be turned into reality that such a moral was to be imitated and that at any rate one ought to shoot himself what had first happened here among a few afterwards took place among the larger public and this little book which had been so beneficial to me was decried as extremely injurious but all the evils and misfortunes which it may have produced were nearly prevented by an accident since even after its production it ran the risk of being destroyed the matter stood thus 
Merck had lately returned from Petersburg. I had spoken to him but little, because he was always occupied and only told him in the most general terms of that Werther which lay next to my heart. He once called upon me, and he did not seem very talkative. I asked him to listen to me. He seated himself on the sofa, and I began to read the tale letter by letter. After I had gone on thus far for a while, without gaining from him any sign of admiration, I adopted a more pathetic strain. But what were my feelings, when at a pause which I made he struck me down in the most frightful manner with, Good! That's very pretty! and withdrew without adding anything more. I was quite beside myself, for as I took great pleasure in my works, and at first passed no judgment on them, I here firmly believed that I had made a mistake in subject, tone, and style, all of which were doubtful, and had produced something quite inadmissible. Had a fire been at hand, I should at once have thrown in the work but i again plucked up courage and passed many painful days until he at last assured me in confidence that at that moment he had been in the most frightful situation in which a man can be placed on this account he had said he had neither seen nor heard anything and did not even know what the manuscript was about in the meanwhile the matter had been set aright as far as was possible and merck in the times of his energy was just the man to accommodate himself to anything monstrous his humour returned only it had grown more bitter than before he blamed my design of rewriting werther with the same expressions which he had used on a former occasion and desired to see it printed just as it was a fair copy was made which did not remain long in my hands for on the very day on which my sister was married to george schlosser a letter from Vagand of leipzig chanced to arrive in which he asked me for a manuscript such a coincidence i looked on as a favourable omen i sent off further and was very satisfied when the remuneration i received for it was not entirely swallowed up by the debts which i had been forced to contract on account of goats von berlichingen the effect of this little book was great nay immense and chiefly because it exactly hit the temper of the times for as it requires but a little match to blow up an immense mine so the explosion which followed my publication was mighty from the circumstance that the youthful world had already undermined itself and the shock was great because all extravagant demands unsatisfied passions and imaginary wrongs were suddenly brought to an eruption it cannot be expected of the public that it should receive an intellectual work intellectually in fact it is only the subject the material part that was considered as i had already found it to be the case among my own friends while at the same time arose that old prejudice associated with the dignity of a printed book that it ought to have a moral aim but a true picture of life has none it neither approves nor censures but develops sentiments and actions in their consequences and thereby enlightens and instructs of the reviews i took little notice i had completely washed my hands of the matter and the good folks might now try what they could make of it yet my friends did not fail to collect these things and as they were already initiated into my views to make merry of them the joys of young werther with which nikolai came forth gave us occasion for many a jest this otherwise excellent meritorious and well-informed man had already begun to depreciate and oppose everything that did not accord with his own way of thinking which as he was of a very narrow mind he held to be the only correct way against me too he must needs try his strength and his pamphlet was soon in our hands the very delicate vignette by Kodowiki gave me such delight as at that time i admired this artist extravagantly the jumbling melody itself was cut out of that rough household stuff which the human understanding in its homely limits 
takes especial pains to make sufficiently coarse without perceiving that there was nothing here to qualify that werther's youthful bloom from the very first appears gnawed by the deadly worm nikolai allows my treatment to pass current up to the two hundred and fourteenth page and then when the desolated mortal is preparing for the fatal step the acute psychological physician contrives to palm upon his patient a pistol loaded with chicken's blood from which a filthy spectacle but happily no mischief arises charlotte becomes the wife of werther and the whole affair ends to the satisfaction of everybody so much i can recall to memory for the book never came before my eyes again i had cut out the vignette and placed it among my most favorite engravings i then by way of quiet innocent revenge composed a little burlesque poem nikolai at the grave of werther which however cannot be communicated on this occasion too the pleasure of giving everything a dramatic shape was again predominant i wrote a prose dialogue between charlotte and werther which was tolerably comical werther bitterly complains that his deliverance by chicken's blood has turned out so badly his life is saved it is true but he has shot his eye out he is now in despair at being her husband without being able to see her for the complete view of her person would to him be much dearer than all those pretty details of which he could assure himself by the touch charlotte as may be imagined has no great catch in a blind husband and thus occasion is given to abuse nikolai pretty roundly for interfering unasked in other people's affairs the whole was written in a good-natured spirit and painted with prophetic forebodings that unhappy conceited humor of nikolai's which led him to meddle with things beyond his compass which gave great annoyance both to himself and others and by which eventually in spite of his undoubted merits he entirely destroyed his literary reputation the original of this judas prix was never copied and has been lost sight of for years the pure ardent attachment of the two young persons was rather heightened than diminished by the comico tragic situation into which they were thus transposed the greatest tenderness prevailed throughout and even my adversary was not treated ill-naturedly but only humorously i did not however let the book itself speak quite so politely in imitation of an old rhyme it expressed itself thus by that conceited man by him i'm dangerous declared the heavy man who cannot swim is by the water scared that berlin pack priest-ridden lot their ban i do not heed and those who understand me not should better learn to read being prepared for all that might be alleged against werther i found those attacks numerous as they were by no means annoying but i had no anticipation of the intolerable torment provided for me by sympathizers and well-wishers these instead of saying anything civil to me about my book just as it was wished to know one and all what was really true in it at which i grew very angry and often expressed myself with great discourtesy to answer this question i should have been obliged to pull to pieces and destroy the form of a work on which i had so long pondered with the view of giving a poetical unity to its many elements and in this operation if the essential parts were not destroyed they would at least have been scattered and dispersed however upon a closer consideration of the matter i could not take the public inquisitiveness in ill part jerusalem's fate had excited great attention an educated amiable blameless young man the son of one of the first theologians and authors healthy and opulent had at once without any known cause destroyed himself every one asked how this was possible and when they heard of an unfortunate love affair the whole youth were excited 
and as soon as it transpired that some little annoyances had occurred to him in the higher circles the middle classes also became excited indeed every one was anxious to learn further particulars now werther appeared an exact delineation as it was thought of the life and character of that young man the locality and person tallied and the narrative was so very natural that they considered themselves fully informed and satisfied but on the other hand on closer examination there was so much that did not fit that there arose from those who sought the truth an unmanageable busyness because a critical investigation must necessarily produce a hundred doubts the real groundwork of the affair was however not to be fathomed for all that i had interwoven of my own life and suffering could not be deciphered because as an unobserved young man i had secretly though not silently pursued my course while engaged in my work i was fully aware how highly that artist was favored who had an opportunity of composing a venus from the study of a variety of beauties accordingly i took leave to model my charlotte according to the shape and qualities of several pretty girls although the chief characteristics were taken from the one i loved best the inquisitive public could therefore never discover similarities in various ladies and even to the ladies themselves it was not quite indifferent to be taken for the right one but these several charlots caused me infinite trouble because every one who only looked at me seemed determined to know where the proper one really resided i endeavored to save myself like nathan with the three rings by an expedient which though it might suit higher beings would not satisfy either the believing or the reading public footnote on nathan nathan the wise in lessing's play founded on Boccaccio's tale of the three rings translator and footnote i hoped after a time to be freed from such tormenting inquiries but they pursued me through my whole life i sought on my travels to escape them by assuming an incognito but even this remedy was to my disappointment unavailing and thus the author of the little work had he even done anything wrong and mischievous was sufficiently i may say disproportionately punished by such unavoidable importunities subjected to this kind of affliction i was taught but too unequivocally that authors and their public are separated by an immense gulf of which happily neither of them have any conception the uselessness therefore of all prefaces i had long ago seen for the more pains a writer takes to render his views clear the more occasion he gives for embarrassment besides an author may preface as elaborately as he will the public will always go on making precisely those demands which he has endeavored to avoid with a kindred peculiarity of readers which particularly with those who print their judgments seems remarkably comical i was likewise soon acquainted they live for instance in the delusion that an author in producing anything becomes their debtor and he always falls short of what they wished and expected of him although before they had seen our work they had not the least notion that anything of the kind existed or was even possible independent of all this it was now the greatest fortune or misfortune that every one wished to make the acquaintance of this strange young author who had stepped forward so unexpectedly and so boldly they desired to see him to speak to him and even at a distance to hear something from him thus he had to undergo a very considerable crowd sometimes pleasant sometimes disagreeable but always distracting for enough works already begun lay before him nay and would have given him abundance of work for some years if he could have kept to them with his old fervor but he was drawn forth from the quiet the twilight the obscurity which alone can favor pure creation into the noise of daylight where one is lost and others 
where one is led astray alike by sympathy and by coldness by praise and by blame because outward contact never accords with the epoch of our inner culture and therefore as it cannot further us must necessarily injure us yet more than all the distractions of the day the author was kept from the elaboration and completion of greater works by the taste then prevalent in our society for dramatizing everything of importance which occurred in actual life what that technical expression for such it was in our inventive society really meant shall here be explained excited by intellectual meetings on days of hilarity we were accustomed in short extemporary performances to communicate in fragments all the materials we had collected towards the formation of larger compositions one single simple incident a pleasantly naive or even silly word a blunder a paradox a clever remark personal singularities or habits nay a peculiar expression and whatever else would occur in a gay and bustling life took the form of a dialogue a catechism a passing scene or a drama often in prose but oftener in verse by this practice carried on with such genial passion the really poetic mode of thought was established we allowed objects events persons to stand for themselves in all their bearings our only endeavor being to comprehend them clearly and exhibit them vividly every expression of approbation or disapprobation was to pass in living forms before the eyes of the spectator these productions might be called animated epigrams which though without edges or points were richly furnished with marked and striking features the garmarkfeist fair festival is an epigram of this kind or rather a collection of such epigrams all the characters there introduced are meant for actual living members of that society or for persons at least connected and in some degree known to it but the meaning of the riddle remained concealed to the greater part all laughed and few knew that their own marked peculiarities served as the jest the prologue to barth's newest revelations may be looked upon as a document of another kind the smallest pieces are among the miscellaneous poems a great many have been destroyed or lost and some that still exist do not admit of being published those which appeared in print only increased the excitement of the public and curiosity about the author those which were handed about in manuscript entertained the immediate circle which was continually increasing dr barth then at geissen paid me a visit apparently courteous and confiding he laughed over the prologue and wished to be placed on a friendly footing but we young people still continued to omit no opportunity at social festivals of sporting in a malicious vein at the peculiarities which we had remarked in others and successfully exhibited if now it was by no means displeasing to the young author to be stared at as a literary meteor he nevertheless sought with glad modesty to testify his esteem for the most deserving men of his country among whom before all others the admirable justice moser claims special mention the little essays on political subjects by this incomparable man had been printed some years before in the osnaburg intelligenzablatter and made known to me through herder who overlooked nothing of worth that appeared in his time especially if in print moser's daughter frau von voigt was occupied in collecting these scattered papers we had scarcely patience to wait for their publication and i placed myself in communication with her to assure her with sincere interest that the essays which both in matter and form had been addressed only to a limited circle would be useful and beneficial everywhere she and her father received these assurances from a stranger not altogether unknown 
in the kindest manner since an anxiety which they had felt was thus preliminarily removed what is in the highest degree remarkable and commendable in these little essays all of which being composed in one spirit form together a perfect whole is the very intimate knowledge they display of the whole civil state of man we see a system resting upon the past and still in vigorous existence on the one hand there is a firm adherence to tradition on the other movement and change which cannot be prevented here alarm is felt at a useful novelty there pleasure in what is new although it be useless or even injurious with what freedom from prejudice the author explains the relative position of different ranks and the connection in which cities towns and villages mutually stand we learn their prerogatives together with the legal grounds of them we are told where the main capital of the state is invested and what interest it yields we see property and its advantages on the one hand on the other taxes and disadvantages of various kinds and then the numerous branches of industry and in all this past and present times are contrasted osnaberg as a member of the hanseatic league we are told had in the earlier periods an extensive and active commerce according to the circumstances of those times it had a remarkable and fine situation it could receive and produce of the country and was not too far removed from the sea to transport it in its own ships but now in later times it lies deep in the interior and is gradually removed and shut out from the sea trade how this has occurred is explained in all its bearings the conflict between england and the coasts and of the havens with the interior is mentioned here are set forth the great advantages of those who live on the seaside and deliberate plans are proposed for enabling the inhabitants of the interior to obtain similar advantages we then learn a great deal about trades and handicrafts and how these have been outstripped by manufactures and undermined by shopkeeping decline is pointed out as a result of various causes and this result in its turn as the cause of a further decline in an endless circle which it is difficult to unravel yet it is so clearly set forth by the vigilant citizen that one fancies one can see the way to escape from it the author throughout displays the clearest insight into the most minute circumstances his proposals his counsel nothing is drawn from the air and yet they are often impracticable on which account he calls his collection patriotic fancies although everything in it is based on the actual and the possible but as everything in public life is influenced by domestic condition this especially engages his attention as objects both of his serious and sportive reflections we find the changes in manners and customs dress diet domestic life and education it would be necessary to indicate everything which exists in the civil and social world to exhaust the list of subjects which he discusses and his treatment of them is admirable a thorough man of business discourses with the people in weekly papers respecting whatever a wise and beneficent government undertakes or carries out that he may bring it to their comprehension in its true light this is by no means done in a learned manner but in those varied forms which may be called poetic and which in the best sense of the word must certainly be considered rhetorical he is always elevated above his subject and understands how to give a cheerful view of the most serious subjects now half concealed behind this or that mask now speaking in his own person always complete and exhausting his subject at the same time always in good humor more or less ironical thoroughly to the purpose honest well-meaning sometimes rough and vehement and all this so well regulated that the spirit understanding facility 
skill taste and character of the author cannot but be admired in the choice of subjects of general utility deep insight enlarged views happy treatment profound yet cheerful humor i know no one to whom i can compare him but franklin such a man had an imposing effect upon us and greatly influenced a youthful generation which demanded something sound and stood ready to appreciate it we thought we could adapt ourselves to the form of his exposition but who could hope to make himself master of so rich an entertainment and handle the most unmanageable subjects with so much ease but this is our purest and sweetest illusion one which we cannot resign however much pain it may cause us through life that we would where possible appropriate to ourselves nay even reproduce and exhibit as our own that which we prize and honor in others end of the autobiography of goethe volume two from my life poetry and truth by johann wolfgang von goethe translated by john oxenford eighteen twelve to eighteen seventy seven